Okay, so this is now the content introduction uh, to the topic. And there we will start with three, three elements. We will start from the top, so to say. We will discuss motivation for secure software. Why is it needed? Uh, and why why do we need extra activities specifically? So is it isn't isn't it simply um, fe fe feasible to cr code securely uh, by having quality assurance practices? And there you go. And uh, obviously, if you look at what happens in the market, this is not the case. So therefore, I will expand a little bit on the motivation for secure software. We will look at uh, uh, the attacker's view and at the customer's expectations. So we will try to uh, set the scene and, and to build a frame, uh, so to say, in which we're going to uh, be um, then into, um, actively look at the different technology aspects. So um, here are the topics uh, that we will shortly discuss about motivation for secure software, software security versus safety, security versus correctness, why is security software urgently needed? Why is secure software development often rejected? What are the consequences? And how important are it to their stakeholders? So security versus safety. So one important thing is uh, to recognize that security and safety are two major and overlapping and more and more overlapping aspects of software, but they are not identical. Uh, let me start, start with safety. Safety is the state of being protected against hazards, um, which where the hazard could actually be also um, into, introduced or, or started by some software malfunctioning, where security is the state of being protected against malicious active stakeholders that target to harm uh, oneself. So you could actually think of... Uh, as if you have some software um, that operates, and since we're more and more having industrial IT um, being used over the world, um, some software that operates some device, uh, and this device could have some impact on people, then the safety aspect uh, says that the device should not harm people, where security says uh, external attackers should not be able uh, to uh, make changes or access the device uh, so that they can make use of the information or st actually also start harming people by changing the functioning of the device. Um, there's a, main, uh, a major difference uh, uh, also from a, from a statistical, uh, a mathematical point of view. Um, Security events, uh, so security, these are events that are induced uh, or introduced by um, hackers, by, by people, by active, uh, by active players. They do not occur according to statistical relevant probability. So it's not um, in difference to car accidents, for example, or weather, uh, uh, weather um, hazards. Um, uh, you cannot uh, statistically analyze uh, hacker events so that you get some, uh, some statistically relevant uh, distribution over time. And this, this, is an, this is, by the way, uh, the reason why uh, insurances for uh, cyber activities are so hard um, uh, to construct and to, to develop because the insurances work with these type of Gaussian distribution uh, so that they can um, actually make sure that they still make uh, money with their business model. Uh, but this is not the case for security risks, and we call them non-systemic. So they come from outside of a system, so to say. So there is an active intruder, an active uh, person that is outside of that system. There are first attempts to take uh, hackers into, into the system and to get some analysis done. And this, interestingly, this is very... As the, the theory is very similar to, um, uh, to a terrorist attack type of um, uh, statistics. Uh, but again, here, uh, the, um, uh, this, the, the effect is very similar that you cannot predict, uh, so to say, um, with, some, uh, with some probability uh, what, uh, how, how big uh, uh, an event, a negative event is going to be. 
uh, and how long it will take until until the next comes. So this, these are the, the proper properties we have from safety. Uh, we cannot apply them here. So uh, standard, <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons uh, that uh, you can actually uh, not uh, take standard business decisions uh, for security like you do it uh, for uh, in, in the other areas that are safety relevant, where you say, okay, now it happens, since it's happened now, it, we will have some time, it's going not to happen, and so we're going to be revealed. You cannot expect this to work in security. So that's one one bigger thing. Another thing I would like to expand on a little bit is this one. Uh, you can see the slide with that graph, and um, let me shortly explain this. So the blue box is the functionality expected by the customer that wants some software to be developed. Um, so the, the big, the full blue box, uh, whereas the full red box is the functionality delivered to the customer. And as if you're working as a software engineer in part time, uh, as you may know, this is in most cases not identical. So uh, you will always have a, uh, uh, some sort of deviation between uh, the expectation and the delivery of specific software. Um, and uh, whereas typically in quality assurance you would try to cover the blue one with the red one so that the box uh, which is uh, named missing correctness so this area is empty so that the, the, the red one is fully extended over the blue one um, you would you would uh, expect that everything that the customer asked for is actually also part of the delivery. Uh, you could understand security of uh, being um, the state or, or insecurity being functionality that is developed by the, uh, uh, the by the software manufacturer whether while it's not being expected. And there's two there are two examples. One is uh, typically, developers tend to make reuse of uh, larger software components, and that is that is for a good reason because software reuse is a good thing in general. But if the software reuse with larger software components and larger uh, um, uh, libraries, actually, uh, that could um, uh, lead to an effect where uh, attackers could make use of functionality that the, the, uh, the customer who runs the software is not even aware of that it's there. So, so there may be, say, for example, uh, a web uh, server running in a telephone, uh, whereas, the, whereas the, the customer would not expect a web server being in a telephone, but still there's a, te there's a web server, and if this web server is not maintained, then it might actually be well, easily doable to hack the phone uh, for example, to, to to record calls or to to initiate calls that that the customer did not expect. Another example is uh, you could. This is more theoretical, but still you could actually um, also consider uh, vulnerabilities that uh, uh, that developers coders have integrated into software. Um, you could actually understand them as being added additional functionality. There are additional functionality not towards the customer, but towards another stakeholder, namely the hacker. So if you have um, a web interface and you have a database in the background and you have some, uh, some input output ongoing and if you're actually um, being able to, uh, being able or if you're not paying attention not to allow um, SQL injection, um, then there is an additional functionality provided by the software that is, has not been expected by the customer. So um, you can see here, this is the main reason why I, I'm arguing together with a couple of, of, of peers in my, in my, uh, in my expert area uh, that uh, correctness and security not, not only are not, um, um, uh, security cannot be taken over by correctness, but even moreover, they're even conflicting in some, in some areas. So that if you, if you want to have a very good correctness that actually that often leads to uh, um, security being a little bit worse. So, okay, this is, this is I do not need to take part of, on this. I think, why is it urgently needed? There are more and more criminal activities there 
two groups of uh, hackers. We will discuss them later um, a little bit in more detail, but there are two major groups of hackers. One is organized crime uh, and the other one is uh, state uh, actors uh, that, um, that actually use that for, uh, for industrial espionage and so on. Um, so this is this is ongoing, and we can observe this. Uh, and um, uh, of course, there are, there are still some individual hackers around, but this is um, uh, not really a considerable size. So actually, we 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 really need to concentrate on these two groups um, if you want to make software secure. Another reason why we need software to be secure by itself um, is the fact that uh, for a long time uh, we tried uh, to actually make software secure, uh, uh, to make a system secure, sorry, by putting additional uh, security devices and security solutions around them, like uh, firewalls or antivirus solutions. Um, the problem here is that they do not work anymore as expected. So um, yeah, firewalls do not work because everything now more or less is tunneled through HTTP. So uh, the idea of spreading activities among different ports uh, so that we be able to control uh, activities at that level does not really work anymore because of the standardization of internet protocols and uh, um, 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 web, the way web applications work. Uh, similar example for antivirus. Uh, um, uh, malware now is able to change itself on the fly uh, from one uh, installation to another uh, so that you can no longer actually um, uh, uh, assure that there is no such um, uh, such and uh, you cannot uh, no longer discover uh, the malware um, elements um, um, since they're they're, they're patterns mostly pattern based. There are approaches for malware identification using uh, using behavioral based um, elements, so to observe the malware and try to actually. Um, identify malware based on its behavior, uh, but this uh, is still uh, at its infancy and uh, there's a lot of false positives, uh, which makes it hard specifically in the consumer environment uh, to deal with these type of uh, solutions. So basically, uh, all the, the big approaches for securing so systems by adding security functionality on top or outside did actually fail, so we need to make software secure by itself. Um, so why why are people not putting more effort into into these activities, specifically here on the developer side? Um, uh, so we still have the effect that most uh, most companies developing software, if they are not in the security market, if they are not experienced in that area, um, just a second, please. Um, they still fear uh, reputation loss. So uh, th this is a kind of a, a self-contradictory element, but this is, this is a little bit due uh, also to what I explained earlier, that standard, uh, with the statistical reason, um, standard business uh, managers often think uh, that uh, the, uh, if someone talks negatively about their software, uh, for example, that there is a security vulnerability, then their fear that their reputation is going to be going down, um, and they will have some competitive disadvantage in 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 due in due course. The problem, though, is that the loss of reputation is much higher if you're not taking security into account. But this only comes after the fact. So this is this is later. This is far in the future, and so therefore, often often this is rejected. Decision makers are often, still today, often unaware of the importance of security aspects and they think that, well, let's, let's do some tests whether we are secure and then we fix it and then we're fine. That this penetrate and patch, how it's called, this penetrate and patch approach actually works. 
unfortunately it doesn't work very well so actually um, you should understand uh, your security requirements in the first place and then to be able to argue why your software is able to deliver on these um, software projects um, if, if it's a project-based organization uh, we often have the problem that uh, um, uh, the projects are are over um, undersized and overwhelmed with requirements um, so there, there, are, there are more requirements than you could deliver anyway. So um, then developers tend, and this is natural, I think, uh, they tend uh, to put their focus on functionality. Uh, and uh, and oh, the non-functional aspects will only come after this. And this is also one of the uh, uh, reasons that we specifically in, in large um, government projects, we see security problems often rising uh, in software. Um, and of course, uh, so um, non-functional requirements are also more difficult to understand. And if they're not skilled in non-functional requirements, they will just un not see them and maybe ignore them as well. What are the consequences? Um, I think that that's, uh, self-describing insecure software leads to insecure transaction and data processing. Insecure software ultimately is more expensive than secure software, uh, even, in, uh, even if you add the, the upfront investments for uh, securing the development process. Um, uh, patch application, uh, patch management is a big is a big theme right now and it poses a lot of problems in many situations. If uh, if you are uh, say for example developing software for for the medical sector or for the pharmaceutical sector, uh, then you need to uh, get your software re-evaluated uh, once it's changed. Um, so uh, it's a, a very difficult question for those operating medical software whether they're going to patch medical software or not because if they patch it uh, then they lose their accreditation or their certification if they don't patch it it's open for hackers to be um, actually changed so this is this is a difficult situation um, customers using insecure software put their reputations at risk um, obviously and companies that distribute into insecure software put their core business at risk Nevertheless, we must say this is not all true for all players. So, um, say, look at Apple, maybe seven, eight years ago, uh, Apple wasn't taking care about security uh, seriously, let's say. Um, still, they uh, had an enormous growth in their market. Um, we all, uh, Though, I must say that in the meantime, they have actually um, um, really good people um, uh, hired um, that help Apple doing these things right and the architecture of the system has very much improved over time uh, compared to Windows. Windows still is the, I think the most um, uh, the most uh, advanced player regarding software security in the software market. They invested an in uh, unbelievable uh, si uh, number of uh, dollars in, in securing their software they even shipped Windows Vista with a delay of 15 months just because of security reasons. And this is something uh, that was unseen in the secure market before. There are different stakeholders. They have and different security requirements. This is, I think, the first thing to remind, and we will come back to this in the software security requirements session uh, on the 18th. Uh, it's not enough to look at specific security functionality or non-functional elements of a generic element of a generic size, like uh, say availability or uh, non-repudiation or things like that. Uh, these are important on a, at a technical level, but we need to to really understand the different security requirements. We need to understand the expectations of the different stakeholders. And stakeholders are not only customers. So if you have software, then you have users in the first place. You may also have management, but you have stakeholders further, up, further down the road, like states uh, that expect that so software is running in a specific uh, setup. It comes from compliance 
uh, uh, down to abilities in specific regions of the world to access information uh, on a state uh, interest. Um, you may have banks interest in behind that or chartered accountants. So security, soft, security of software um, needs uh, also to, uh, uh, or if you if you look at if we look at security of software, we need to understand uh, that um, uh, there are a number of stakeholders to take into account. So the first activity uh, in the software requirement engineering for security is actually to understand which are all my stakeholders that I need to think of um, in terms of security. And maybe they, there may also be hidden stakeholders like uh, foreign intelligence agencies that uh, not expressively would argue but still have some expectation of being of certain f security not being there, let's say it this way. So this is something we need also to deal with. That was the first part. I will go on now to the attackers. Any questions so far? Okay, the question was um, regarding stakeholders. What exactly, which type of stakeholder does the government represent? Um, and um, the what I wanted to express here is that even if a private company sells software to another private company, uh, then the state, the government, could have a stake in the way that the software works. Um, so, for example, you would expect in a business software that the uh, compliance or expectations for um, uh, non-repudiation and for segregation of duties are implemented. So that, um, that the user, so the company that has bought the software cannot trick the software or cannot use the software in such a way that they can trick the tax authorities, for example, so that they could use the software for uh, not paying taxes as, as they are expected. That's, that's one example. Another example is, is uh, in specific regions of the world, let's say, for example, China, um, the software must be written in such a way that there is uh, some a third party access available so that in case of this that police or other agencies are uh, required to access information in the systems that they have access to that information so there is some some additional functionality and that may be security relevant right so if the if the third party access is done through malware uh, then the question is, would that software detect the malware? That would be the expected behavior from a security point of view. Or is it actually the state's interest of not detecting the malware? You're welcome. So, uh, the view of the attacker. Uh, we will um, cook at some definitions, see some famous examples. We look at skill levels, hacker uh, the hacker uh, modes, uh, processes, and uh, go through the for the different terms and terminologies that we were going to use in the next uh, in the next weeks together. So the original meaning of the term hacker is a, is the following: a technical enthusiast with deep knowledge using information technology out of intended scope for his her desired purpose enjoying the intellectual challenge to circumvent constraints so actually this is not really malicious right so this is just a technical enthusiast that wants to use technology maybe in a different way than it that it was actually meant for but, but first and foremost for his intellectual um, enjoyment 
Um, but uh, since this is not, uh, this is this has been uh, used differently in in uh, uh, in the wild and in in, uh, in uh, pub publications in in the public. In the in the um, in our in our community, uh, we replace this with two different uh, terms. Uh, one is um, cracker for criminal hacker. Um, the term cracker describes individuals who seek to compromise the security without permission. And we have the ethical hacker. That's the individual who performs security tests and other vulnerability assessment activities to help organizations secure their infrastructures. And sometimes they are also referred as white hat hackers, whereas the criminal hackers are referred to as black hat hackers. And this is where um, the, the name of the conference comes from that you may know, the Black Hat Conference in the US is the largest today, I think it's the largest uh, uh, hacking convention. Um, and the interesting thing about the Black Hat is that you will see there, or if you go there, you will, you will be able to meet both white hat hackers and black hat hackers. So it's kind of a uh, um, uh, uh, a peace area where they can, where they can, where people from the good and the bad side meet and discuss uh, about uh, um, practices and uh, and things like that. There's also the tame gray hat hacker, and as you can imagine, gray hat hackers are people who sometimes have a white hat on and sometimes a, b a, a black hat on. Uh, and some, mm, I wouldn't say colleagues, but some contacts I have, uh, they call themselves gray hat hackers. So you see them on and off at conferences. They have their own business, but they also uh, are acting uh, uh, in the dark, so to say. Uh, can you repeat this, please? Yeah. No, that's exactly what it's meant for. So white hat hackers are uh, ethical hackers. So this is the group of people that that hacks for the purpose of securing the systems and the software, not for the purpose of making money out of malicious activities or having other motivations that we will see in a minute. Okay? So, firmest examples, uh, you may know Adrian Lamo, uh, and he was actually... Uh, he exploited security weaknesses in high-profile companies in NBC and New York Times. Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson um, actually were also um, uh, co considered as, as early hackers, but actually they were not criminal hackers. And of course, uh, there's Kevin Mitnick, uh, you probably know from uh, name. Uh, it's the first hacker who hit the FBI most wanted list. So he's uh, the most wanted person to be arrested in the United States. Um, and he broke into DEC, into digital equipment, in Motorola, into NSA and others. And Vladimir Levin was the first who um, really made a, a lot of money uh, out of hacking activities. I think that was in '98. A Russian hacker who led a team of hackers who siphoned 10 million from Citibank and transferred the money to bank accounts around the world. Uh, he and the, but he was arrested and the authorities recovered all but uh, 400 million. So these are some examples and you can research them if you want to and 
and look at what they did. Actually, the, the interesting approach is, uh, if, you, if you look at history of hacking, the first hacking actually, uh, the first malicious hacking, so to say, was done by uh, trying to have some free uh, distance, long distance calls over the phone. So you may may remember, or if not, I'm just quickly telling you. Um, in um, uh, just after the uh, the Second World War, uh, the United States was uh, fully equipped uh, uh, with, uh, with a telephone infrastructure, um, where everybody had a telephone at his home, um, and uh, the local. Uh, um, telephone providers, they actually quickly realize that people are uh, uh, not not willing to pay for local phone calls since they had already paid some some uh, some some uh, fee for uh, some monthly fee for for having the phones, uh, but they would be happy to pay for long distance calls. So this led to a situation where local calls were free. Uh, for a long period of time, but long distance calls were very expensive, say for example from New York to Boston. Um, and uh, hackers, the first hackers tried to make uh, long distance calls for free by tricking the phone system by sending sending uh, signals over the, uh, the telephone line that uh, actually managed the automatic system running behind uh, to offer a free long distance call. So that's that's the, the origin of hacking, if you want to say. Now let's look at skill levels. Um, uh, people called hacker or hackers by the mass media can be differentiated by a number of skill levels. And uh, some common, common skill levels I put here you may know script kiddies, so they typically have uh, very little technical skills, but they, um, they, they can use scripts and programs, so therefore script kiddies, scripts and programs to exploit known, known vulnerabilities. There. So they're not researching vulnerabilities, they're just making use of existing vulnerabilities, but they don't even uh, program themselves, they only use the tools. Now, now the tool set today is so big, that more or less everybody could become a script kitty from a from a skill levels point of view, uh, and at le I'm sure at least that the, the least thing that you will achieve as a hacker level a skill level after this course is that you will be um, at at least a script kitty. Maybe you're going to be even more. The next level is dedicated hacker. So the dedicated hacker knows the in and out of the operating system. He will do his own research for vulnerabilities. He knows the common audit and security tools, uh, and he knows how to use the available tools to enter systems. So not only to exploit vulnerabilities and to send something malicious there, but also to be present in the system. And this is something you may be able to attain at the end of this course, uh, depending on your on your motivation of advancing. So I will, I will provide you with the corresponding uh, tool sets and learning environments, but uh, you're not... Uh, there's no guarantee that you will be there. So this is, and as as the, as the name says, it it requires some level of dedication. Um, I have a friend of mine who started, uh, who who was a security software engineer for 20 years, and now started for five years into the hacking scene. So he moved himself there, uh, and uh, he uh, he tells uh, he's telling consequently stories where he's often uh, sitting hours and days and maybe sometimes even weeks uh, trying to find a specific vulnerability in a system uh, and this is this can be really demanding uh, in terms of in terms of uh, motivation uh, to keep uh, to keep the concentration high to get into such a system and so it really the, the, the hacking job actually has a high level of dedication required to be successful. And of course we have the skilled hacker, so this is uh, uh, the, the highest level, so uh, skilled hackers know the inner working of the targeted systems, networks and protocols. They often uh, uh, 
are developers of the protocols themselves. So they're in generally speaking, they are excellent programmers and they're they have contributed in many cases also to standardization of specific protocols or systems. Um, uh, and they're um, the skilled hackers, if they go down that route, uh, then they're they will be trying in the first phase. Uh, so they're not so much uh, interested in in the intellectual challenge like the dedicated hacker, but more uh, in the uh, in the in the result. So therefore, the skills uh, that he's assembling is his um, is uh, his collection of weapons, and so therefore he's very interested in uh, collecting all necessary information to the targeted systems, so that he's using uh, the tools the best he can. So there are a number of hacking modes um, that also should be understood and ha had in your mind as a background. Obviously, there are things like insider attacks, so hacking by an, in principle, authorized individual, but still wants to trick the system for some personal reason. Um, there are, of course, outsider attacks. But what also happens often is that you try and steal equipment uh, to retrieve information out of hardware like laptops, maybe also smartphones. Uh, obviously, physical entry is also used. Uh, often, uh, in uh, physical entry is a prepar preparatory activity for hackers, for example, by placing malicious devices into the network. Um, uh, and uh, also social engineering attacks is, are used uh, where uh, the employees, for example, are tricked uh, to provide information. And since humans can still be manipulated very easily, this is often, often used um, today. So the, uh, the major, I would say 90% of the, hacking, the successful hacking attacks today are done through a first phase of social engineering uh, where uh, in the first phase uh, say spam email, phishing emails are sent into the system and the hackers expect that one or two out of them will actually click uh, on, on a phishing email which, which is some sort of social engineering and only if they click on their uh, malicious software is going to be installed uh, and from there hackers can then start investigating uh, more uh, targets into, into the environment depending on what their targets are actually of course. What are the motives, the motivations of hackers? Obviously still for many people the intellectual motivation is important. Um, so specifically, all the early hacks were made of curiosity in exploring the capabilities of technology. The intellectual challenge is still the driving force for many security researchers. Security re researchers are white hat hackers, mostly some are great hat hackers, that are actually um, um, making money out of identifying vulnerabilities and then selling them or, 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 or sending them to vendors. And then uh, there, um, there's a big market. Uh, some, there are even platforms where you can uh, auction your security vulnerability that you have identified. And uh, this is the people who want to become uh, security researchers. They need to have some high intellectual motivation uh, to, to be able to do this at all because this is really um, technolo te te technologically speaking um, very demanding. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, so in the last three years, two, three years, there's a big, uh, big class of vulnerabilities coming up which is called deserialization attacks. Um, deserialization is... Uh, a security issue uh, that occurs when you're sending 
uh, structured elements from one computer to another, or from one service to another service, uh, and specifically discovered uh, the first discovery of deserialization uh, vulnerabilities were in Java, in Java, uh, where in the RMI protocol uh, this deserialization bug was a feature. What what why is this why is this uh, critical? Deserialization is the process of um, uh, restructuring elements that have been sent over the wire between two computers, where the descending computer actually serialized a structured element, and it needs to be deserialized again at um, uh, where it's actually. Uh, um, uh, sent to at the recipient, um, and you see the deserialization attack uh, is uh, very very hard to find. So once the pattern is known in a specific programming language, then you can find another a number of different patterns. But you you really need to understand the ins and outs of the inner working of uh, the way that a, a programming language works and how the serialization, deserialization process is working. And only if you understand this and you have, you're ready to invest so much time into understanding this, then you're able to find deserialization. Um, now we have deserialization in PHP, in Perl, uh, in, and in other scripting languages. So it actually sp it starts spreading over the different uh, uh, programming languages, and it's a very critical issue because you can then access get read root access using a, a specific uh, a corresponding malware that you constructed. Another motivation is educational experimentation. So this is I'm trying to uh, to learn about the system uh, by um, experimenting. Um, harmless fun, obviously, uh, has been has been a motivation earlier on. Then, of course, you have a wide range of personal motivation from uh, fun to taking revenge. Uh, disgruntled employees, that was a large part of the motivation in the early 2000s. This is, we don't see it so much anymore because I think most employees fear that the detection capabilities of the in the IT systems are improving more and more. Of course, you have other more political type of motivations. These are the first three here. There's social motivation, rectifying the inequality of social injustice, political motivation based on of a specific political idealism uh, or cyber terrorism even uh, to uh, um, uh, target critical infrastructures like power, water, transportation, and so on. And finally, the biggest one today, uh, beside political, as if you if you look at uh, non-state hacking activities, uh, then the largest and by far the largest motivation today is the financial motivation, and um, uh, most hackers. Uh, that are active in that area are organized in crime networks. Uh, so there is a there's a um, an underground mafia, if you want uh, to call it, um, that um, controls. I would say eighty percent of the hackers of the world, eighty ninety percent, by some way or the other. Since in at some point of time, uh, hackers need to get. Uh, need to work, need to get into interaction with, with people that sell uh, vulnerabilities or with uh, people that sell their services to hack. Uh, and, uh, and up uh, there you go, you have the connection to the, to the organize, organized crime. Um, we will not so much cover uh, political motivation, but I just, just I want you to, to remember to make sure that this is always the case. Uh, the more advanced uh, technology development is, and it's the same is true for software, the more interest comes also from states to control 
information flow and usage of computers and computer technology and software. So uh, I do not know the state of play in uh, northern um, Africa and uh, maybe even more specifically in Tunisia, but I know for example that specific activities in France or Germany um, are state supported, let me call it that way, um, so that you, you still you always have to deal with this type of stakeholder. Uh, what's the process of hacking? Um, so uh, hacking can at a very high level be described in three steps. Some, some other theories uh, describe it in four steps, but I think three is, um, three is, ex is enough for understanding the approach. Uh, first is selecting a target, so uh, which is the right target to hack, and obviously what are our criteria uh, for 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 choosing a target? It's uh, sometimes visibility depends on the motivation, of course. Uh, then the topics of the targets, um, available information. So if is is there good information about a specific system so that I will be successful? and obviously the value for the hacker. Um, in some cases uh, you may get a request um, to hack a certain company uh, and then uh, hacking the company uh, is, is the overall expected um, say uh, outcome uh, of, uh, um, of, your, of your work uh, if you're a hacker towards your customer let's call it um, and the customer uh, would in general not be interested in the technological approach but only the result of your work. Say for example um, information about uh, future planned products or information about uh, func uh, financial flows or so um, uh, which uh, how the company is structured, where is the money residing and so on. So you're, you, as a hacker, you have the choice of the, the specific target, whether you're targeting the SAP system or the, whether you're targeting the Windows domain infrastructure and so on. Next uh, step is uh, the information gathering or reconnaissance phase, uh, how it's called uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the agency's uh, language. Uh, and you would then try to collect as much information as possible before you start actually hacking. So information about the company, about the systems, about the business partners. Maybe you will not directly hack the system uh, at the company side. You will first hack a system which is easier to hack uh, of a business partner of the company you're targeting. Um, maybe you also... Uh, wants to know which people are talking to whom, so you you will employ social engineering for uh, for um, let people believe that that you are part of the business partner network uh, and that you are a trusted person, and uh, so by this uh, uh, to be able to prepare your c concrete uh, physical uh, hacking activity, not physical, your your active software hacking activity. And the last one is then the gaining the access. So the, obviously then now is, if I'm well prepared, I have all the information I need. I know the systems. I know the vulnerabilities of the systems. I know uh, everything I need uh, to be able to uh, judge whether my attack will be successful or not or which attack I'm planning will be successful or not. And then uh, um, I'm gaining access and I could even, I could use network access or system access. This is a big difference and this still plays a role today, this difference, although this, uh, this, um, uh, this structuring is a little bit old, it's 10 years old now, uh, but um, uh, I would say um, system access is uh, supported uh, by social engineering um, activities like drive-by download or, or um, uh, enabling people uh, to or, or uh, tricking people to install software by um, uh, by a phishing or by spam email um, that would be by this way I would be able to access the system of the user and from there start start going on 
Further, sometimes I have situations where I do not have a back channel to my computer, so I, I can send comments, uh, uh, I can send commands to that computer, but I do not know the effect immediately. Uh, whereas uh, if you have a back channel like a root shell, this is generic. This is in general the the most prevalent approach, but this needs then typically to have network access uh, and uh, most. Penetration testing activities, so white hat hacking activities, use network access, while most hackers use system access. So, the, so one could argue uh, whether we're doing looking at the right things as as white hat hackers, as pen testers, because we're not following the same path than the attackers. Right. So this is something. Uh, still, I'm trying to convince. Um, uh, my uh, uh, my peers in in that in that scene uh, to also look at system access type of um, hacking activities more. So what are hackers using as tools? They're using Trojan horses. So they're sending a software that looks nice but do, does uh, bad things. So you may remember, I'm sure uh, there have been a, a number of. Uh, apps for Android smartphones that operated as a flashlight or as a, um, um, as a, a light bulb, um, but uh, ultimately uh, they actually collected all the information from, uh, from your contacts database and sent it out uh, for analysis somewhere else. That would be a Trojan horse. A virus is a program that infects others by replicating itself. Um, so a virus um, could actually infect other systems by if you install the software, it could infect it by, by downloading it. And a worm uh, is a pr more rather a transport mechanism uh, than a uh, uh, um, uh, toolkit itself. But this is this is more or less no longer used today. We had. We had some some warm elements uh, uh, in the in the 2015 um, attack on uh, on encryption, uh, so encrypting um, um, computers and hard drives. Uh, but this is uh, this is uh, was not a real warm. It was just using warm elements. Obviously, you can modify source code. So this is specifically a risk for open source software. Uh, there are a number of examples where although the software being open and the expectation is someone else will look at it and will find vulnerabilities, this does not happen. The most prominent example is OpenSSL. So there is the a secure, secure, uh, secure Sockets layer implementation, uh, the open source implementation, OpenSSL, um, that is actually has been uh, has a vulnerability inside, and that has been uh, then uh, consequently been uh, replicated a number of times in modified um, uh, source code where there was some uh, malicious activity there. Uh, you obviously also use uh, try to check passwords. So once you have a user uh, and a password combination, it's easy to get in. So one approach where um, hackers are skilled is cracking passwords. Today, password crackers are uh, internet services where you can uh, buy uh, the password cracking by hour or by, by minutes. So you pay... Um, you can go there. There are there are open available ones, of course, for the white hat hackers. But the good ones, the good password crackers, are available in the darknet, and there you pay by minute. So you pay the uh, uh, the cracking effort, uh, which is which is actually executed by some cloud cloud application. You have using scanners, network scanners, that scan networks for systems and services like Nmap, and you use vulnerability scanners. I'm sure you know these, so we probably do not need to get into more detail into this ones. And sniffers, uh, most prominent example here, Wireshark. We will make use of uh, Wireshark and Nmap and maybe Nessus in the next, uh, no, not Nessus, another one 
you will learn another program uh, in on the 17th of April. Okay, last part of the introductory uh, introductory um, uh, section here. Uh, let's look at uh, customers. So customers expect secure software. The problem is, though, in my view, uh, that most customers they have some mm, very unclear understanding of what security actually means. So they would say, well, it must be secure or something like, well, I, it, it, the confidential information must be kept confidential. Mm -hmm. uh, question is, what does that mean specifically in a, in a technology, uh, at a technology level? So the problem uh, I see is that customers often are not able to express their security expectations and their security requirements correctly. Consequently, if now if we are not hackers, if we are software developers, um, then we need to help the customer to formulate his security requirements. Because if you're not if you're not doing this, then he still have he will have these requirements and his expectations, but you don't, do not explicitly know them, and the chances are high that you will miss them. And the customers will then be, but uh, in some sort, uh, if if a hack will happen, if a vulnerability is discovered, will say, hey, but I told you I'm expecting this. And you will say as a software developer, hmm, uh, we didn't discuss this in detail, I didn't know, but I, I don't care. He will say, this is your job to understand this. So this, is an, this, this, this comes after the fact, um, this is, it is a very unpleasant uh, discussion happening. So it's worthwhile spending some time very early in the uh, requirements engineering phase to try and uh, help the customer formulate his security requirements. Um, what are the customer expectations? There are no there is no common set of uh, no no checklist that you could use. Obviously we need to work with the standard security elements like confidentiality, integrity and availability, both of information and systems, authorization and access control, and robustness against outsider attacks. Uh, solutions are specific to developed systems and may be actually be secure functions and security functions. Let me spend a few minutes on this, on this differentiation. Secure functions are functions that are actually uh, implementing a certain use case or requirement of the customer which is not security specific but needs to be handled securely. Let's say for example uh, collecting payment information by credit card. So this would be, uh, or, or executing payment by credit card, even worse. Um, then this, the, the function that you are actually trying to implement is, is not security related, but it has a high demand of security so that it must be run securely. So more in more detail, if you want to store credit card information, then for compliance reasons, uh, it must be encrypted as a PSI DSS uh, requirement of credit card uh, companies all over the world that are requesting specific uh, handling activities, how credit cards must be handled. Um, among others, one is to be to encrypt them at rest. Uh, but it must also be uh, secure against eavesdropping whilst it's, um, um, it's transmitted. Um, so these are secure functions. A security function is a function that is dedicated for providing a specific security. Uh, for example, encryption. Encryption would be a security function. Or authorization check would be a security function. Or authentication would be a security function. Um, malware identification would also be a security function. Um, and as I said at the beginning, uh, expectation from businesses is always that you can, um, that you can 
uh, turn a non-functional requirement into a function so that you can externalize, that's the name, the, 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 the term used for this, to externalize this demand. Uh, so if you want to have a high availability, a very high available website, uh, then you can use load balancers. Load balancers would be an availability function. And the load balancer externalizes uh, the availability demand to a specific component, namely the load balancer. And the same is true, the same expectation is true for security. But as I tried to explain at the beginning, that does not really work in the security space. So all, um, uh, all approaches to, to uh, totally turn non-functional security requirements or fulfill non-functional security requirements by developing specific security functions ended in these security functions not being able to fully uh, uh, actually accomplish this demand. Whether it's encryption, whether it's anti-malware, whether it's firewall, network protection, you still need to deal with secure functions. So therefore, I wanted to expand on this. The difference is important uh, for the uh, acceptance criteria we will define in the requirements engineering phase. And I will come back to this uh, on the um, 18th of April. You can actually... Yeah. Um, the question is whether um, um, actually uh, secure functions need security functions. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, in, in many cases, you need some security functions to provide secure functions, but in most cases, it's not uh, complete. So you cannot uh, fulfill all uh, non-functional requirement elements by this security function. So let's say encryption. Um, the the non-functional security requirement would be confidentiality of data of information, and one security function that helps um, um, achieving this goal is encryption. Now, the encryption uh, only services this well if the key is well chosen. The encryption key, if the key is securely stored. Uh, so that um, attackers cannot access the encryption key. And most importantly, once am I, if I'm accessing the data when I'm using it, uh, it's going to be encrypted at some point in time since I need, I need to access it. And this transport mechanism, this transfer must be secure, must be uh, secured against eavesdropping. And this is... Uh, so you always have elements which can which cannot be... Uh, actually fully implemented by security functions. But yes, in most cases, for secure functions, you need supporting security functions. We can classify security requirements. Uh, so, uh, if um, uh, according to how, how well they can be implemented, from a software developer's point of view, the most easy situation would be if you can implement the security or um, if you can fulfill the security requirement by configuration. Uh, next would be by using additional third-party product, optional third-party product. So this is, these are the two functionality elements. Uh, the third is implement your own security functionality. So it's something that you need to do yourself within the software. And finally, this is the most difficult one, is we need to assure specific security qualities uh, throughout the whole development life cycle. This is the secure functions approach. And uh, ideally, you should be approaching this top-down so that uh, the, from a the developer's point of view, from a software manufacturer's point of view, the effort is minimal because the, the secure function uh, is the, the, the most difficult one. You may also have requirements from the customer for the support processes. So in general, 
you cannot sell software like fire and forget so send it to the customer it runs and you're no longer dealing uh, with that software that was the case i would say in the 90s and maybe all, uh, also at the beginning of the uh, of this uh, century but now we have the situation uh, where you have a long-term support and often software is even connected to cloud services. Uh, so you need an ongoing support for the systems and specifically uh, to correct security problems, to fix security vulnerabilities. To be able to do this, uh, there's two, two capabilities you need to assure within your organization and this is something we will deal later on uh, uh, at, uh, during security response um, uh, at, at the 18th. Uh, one is you need specific communication skills. So you, be a you need to be able to communicate to your customers uh, about the severity of a vulnerability and that he has to react now. Um, and the second is you need, of course, to be able to fix uh, the problem in the software. So if if your project team that has developed the software now is working on another project, you still need to get them back and fix the issue for a certain time. Uh, and this is, this is something uh, very difficult. Some customers even expect uh, this in, uh, in their contracts that there is even a maximum time uh, until the fixing has happened. This is uh, specifically if you're dealing with security issues, a hard job, and this is often often a problem as well. And uh, from a business perspective, it is worthwhile taking this into account in your business model because depending on on your on the on the restrictions and the capabilities you have, this may uh, have a large impact on the business model of the software manufacturer. So if you, for example, but, um, uh, developing software for the stock market, uh, then you will have uh, totally different expectations on reaction times and fixing support for vulnerabilities than if you, say, develop software for, um, for managing uh, the people working in the kindergarten. Well, I don't know something not, not very uh, dramatic. Okay, uh, we could help. This is, this is a first step towards requirements engineering, but I think we should stop here for the moment. I will come back to that, to these slides uh, uh, later on in the, soft, in the security requirements phase, uh, specific, specifically also because we uh, slightly over time now with, uh, with the presentation. Just a few words, assets, um, if, you, if you think about what the requirements are for the different stakeholders, uh, then it makes sense to, just like in the information security management environment, it makes sense to speak about uh, or to identify the assets first, namely the assets that are managed by the software. Uh, and to, uh, to actually identify the different risks that can occur according to these assets. But this will be an exercise we're doing on the 18. So I won't go into detail here uh, on these slides. Finally, um, a software uh, is in most cases operating in regulated environments. There, there's no such thing as regulation-free software usage in my point, from my point of view. There's always some state or some some government or either at the software manufacturer's country or in the user's country, um, you need you have some some sort of uh, compliance requirements, and these should be the first. Uh, this is a checklist, of course, in this case, but this is the first activity to research when you're in such a in, in such a project to find out which of uh, the uh, compliance requirements actually also have some effect on the software that you're uh, developing. And I have mentioned a few here, uh, but this is, this is non-exhaustive and they're, they're constantly changing and adapting, so you need to act constantly uh, adapt. In, in Europe currently, uh, there's, a, there's a very high pressure on software manufacturers from the new uh, general data protection regulation, the GDPR, 
that comes into effect uh, May 28th this year and it's among other things states uh, that the software must be developed using privacy by design principles which is mm, uh, from a software architect's point of view uh, in most cases uh, a, a very different approach than uh, say for example a data centric approach um, which is often used in in database applications today so that's something you should you should actually uh, worry about and should uh, should uh, spend some time as a developer to know what the requirements are even even if uh, if they, they, from a contract contractual point of view the customer should should tell you which are relevant but still you should be able uh, to know more or less what what important elements are okay this is so the summary of today um, software security is often neglected software security seems to be costly actually it is software security needs to be taken seriously and software security i think this is this is the major takeaway for a software developers perspective software security is different from standard software quality and correctness <laughs>